Late in the evening, when it was getting dark, the doorbell rang in my house. I wiped away my tears and checked the screen on the wall. My mother-in-law and Stella were outside probably coming to help. I quickly went to the front door and opened it. To my surprise, my mother-in-law told some people who looked like movers to bring everything inside. I was confused and shocked. My son Wyatt, who was upstairs, heard my confused voice and came downstairs. He asked what was wrong while watching the movers working. I still didn't understand what was happening. My father-in-law, Thomas, was giving orders, and the movers were bringing things into the house. Suddenly, Wyatt looked scared and shouted that we couldn't leave. He said the house wasn't safe because it was haunted. Everyone stopped and looked at Wyatt, who was shaking with fear. My name's Victoria, and I'm 41 years old. My husband, Isaac, is 42 and works as a businessman. He's a calm person who doesn't drink, smoke, or gamble. He works hard every day for our family. His hobby is watching movies with me on weekends. Until last year, our son Wyatt used to join us too, but since he started middle school, he's been more into activities and hanging out with friends, spending less time with us. Although I feel sad about it, Isaac seems to find it heartwarming. He talks about not attending a prestigious private high school like his parents worked at, but choosing a local public high school instead. He reminisces about being the class president and student council president, and his best friend from high school, Thomas. I tease him about Thomas being his best friend, and Isaac laughs, saying his parents would have been shocked to hear that. He gets nostalgic, saying those were fun times. I ask if he's having fun now, as we watch a DVD at home. Isaac simply replies that he is. Then he looks around the living room and corrects himself, saying it's more like happiness. He mentions that we chose and bought this house ourselves and that he has a wonderful wife and a lively son, saying it with a smile. So sincere that it makes me blush. I couldn't ask for more. That's when I playfully say, a beautiful wife, swinging my arm, and Isaac laughs, dodging it. Yes, yes, having a beautiful wife makes me happy. Now all that's left is to work hard to pay off our mortgage. We're still paying off the mortgage on our house, but Isaac has arranged it so I can stay at home without financial strain. I feel lucky to have such a kind husband like Isaac. As we sat side by side watching a DVD, I thought to myself that Isaac has always said he's happy with our married life. But I can't help but think he wasn't very happy before our marriage, especially when he was at his parents' house. It's pretty obvious given the not-so-great relationship he has with his parents and his sister Stella. I heard that the whole issue started when Isaac chose not to attend the high school his parents wanted him to go to. Stella, who's two years older than Isaac, obediently followed their parents' wishes, attending the high school they chose, keeping the high grades they wanted, and even working at a company they approved of. According to Isaac, she can't think or decide for herself. That's the situation. It's easy to just do what your parents tell you, but it also makes you dependent and incapable of making your own decisions or adapting to different situations. This led to her inability to think or make decisions on her own depending on the situation. Sure enough, when Stella started working, she found herself unable to do anything without explicit instructions, feeling uncomfortable. She left the company in less than a year. Then her parents quickly arranged a marriage for her, and she ended up marrying the man her parents chose, despite having Isaac. They also brought in my brother-in-law as their son and had him live with them. To me, it doesn't make sense to adopt a son when they already have Isaac. Speaking of their family, my father-in-law is just a normal businessman. I also didn't feel the need for them to financially overextend themselves to send their kids to private high schools. According to Isaac, that's just silly pride of my parents. He mentioned a wealthy family living near his parents' house. Their daughter was the same age as Stella, and they used to play together as kids. But from elementary school, she went to a private school and ended up distancing herself from the other neighborhood kids. There wasn't any particular incident with that family, but Isaac's parents seemed quite envious of them. They became determined to send their own children to private school as well, saving hard to afford Stella's private high school education. Thanks to the circumstances, dinner at home was rather simple, but Stella's lunches were always extravagant, leading to a rather peculiar dietary lifestyle. Isaac, seeing no need to strain himself, chose to attend a public high school instead of a private one. Chat GPT. I think that was a wise decision. However, my in-laws were furious and their attitude towards Isaac changed drastically from that day. 
They used to take pride in the envious glances they received when mentioning the prestigious high school their daughter attended. When asked about their son, they might have felt embarrassed to admit he attended a public school, but they would have dreamed of a life above unnecessarily, and it would not have been that good. My in-laws and Stella's family, along with their three children, live in a rented house. I'm not saying that renting the house is bad, of course, but I do wonder if there were other ways to use the money effectively besides making the parents look good. They went into debt to send Stella through private high school and college, and they're still paying it off. I could never really understand my in-law's view on money. This was also evident in the amount of money given as Christmas gifts, the amount given to Stella's children and why it was noticeably different. It could be a difference in affection since they lived together, but it seemed unfair to Wyatt. I couldn't help but sigh at the thought of Wyatt also being affected by this. My in-laws also seemed to dislike the fact that we owned our own house. It's a two-story house, larger than my in-law's place, with its four-bedroom layout. Ha! Huh, pretty bold for someone from a public school. Such a fancy house is wasted on you folks. They occasionally visit our house and make such snide remarks. Furthermore, they may pick things like there's a stain here or the hardwood floor is discolored here and there, and then dismissively comment. Chat, GPT, it's not all that impressive after all. Honestly, I don't see the point in them doing that. If they don't like it, they don't have to come over. Isaac thinks it's because they're jealous. They don't have money themselves, and yet here we are, owning a house, even if it's with a mortgage. Isaac laughed, saying it's all because they're always trying to make themselves look good outside. My brother-in-law is probably not poorly paid either, and my father-in-law, even in his sixties, is still working. But their debts are holding them back. Don't worry about it, Isaac says. However, when Isaac and Wyatt are not around, my mother-in-law and Stella take their chance to visit. Lately, they've even started to wander around the house while I'm making tea. We should turn this into our bedroom. My husband likes this European-style room. This large room would be great as a study room for the kids. Don't you think? They were saying such presumptuous things to each other. What are you doing? I finally asked them, letting my annoyance show. They immediately put on fake smiles. Oh, we were just having a look around. You're slow with the tea. I closed the door of the room they were peeking into and asked them to return to the living room. I was a little horrified when my mother-in-law asked for a duplicate key. There was no way I could give my mother-in-law, who walks around in people's houses without permission, a duplicate key. There's a risk of her snooping through our drawers and closets when we're not home. After treating Isaac so poorly, it seemed incredibly selfish for them to ask for a key. Well, I'd need to talk to Isaac about that first. I brushed it off at the time and waited for Isaac to return before firmly declining over the phone. How can you not give a key to your parents? Mother-in-law was furious, but unfortunately, we just can't trust those parents. Anyway, please come over only when either Victoria or I am home. Isaac told her before hanging up. Health is the most important thing, a phrase often said at this age. Suddenly, those words hit home. Isaac was diagnosed with cancer. We were speechless when the tests initially for stomach issues revealed the disease. With each examination, more widespread cancer was discovered. Doctors said without surgery, he only had a few months. We had insurance, but it wasn't enough to cover everything. Not only hospital bills, but there were also living expenses and the house mortgage to consider. The happiness we built seemed to crumble in an instant. I was trembling with the fear of possibly losing Isaac and the anxiety of our future, clueless and scared. All I could do was fear. I'll ask my parents for help. My parents have passed away. And being an only child, I had no relatives to turn to. Okay, I'll go with you. We went to Isaac's parents and Stella's family to explain the situation and ask for financial help. Cancer can often be treated these days, right? Stella seemed not to grasp the severity. The in-laws, although not as much as Stella, were reluctant to help financially. I think I heard a few months ago that you have finished paying off your debts. Yes, we finally managed to do it. Please, we will definitely repay you. Just lend us the money for the surgery and hospital stay. The money you were going to give me for private school, lend it to us now, please. I'll work too. We're begging you. We were practically on our hands and knees. Eh, no way. We just recently started to afford a little luxury. I have an insurance policy that forgives my mortgage in the event of my death. When that happens, we can sell the house and repay the borrowed money. I'll even write a promissory note. We begged repeatedly, but my in-laws shook their heads. 
and despite anticipating it, we were left in despair. Why don't you just sell the house now? Of course, we knew that might be our only option in the end. But if we sell now, we must subtract the remaining mortgage from the sale price and still have enough to cover hospital and treatment costs, as well as rent for a new home. I heard that even after moving out, Isaac used to send money home. When he was single, it seemed only fair that they spend a little money on Isaac's behalf. No matter how much we pleaded, my in-laws and Stella's answers didn't change. Isaac straightened his back and replied calmly, Okay, that's enough. As we were leaving, my brother-in-law came after us, saying, Wait a minute, it's not much, and I'm embarrassed to say I don't have any savings. He handed Isaac $2,000. That's no surprise, he was helping with the debt repayments too, despite their claims of finally paying it off. It was also thanks to him. I'll try to persuade them again. Please don't lose hope. We deeply thanked my brother-in-law for saying that. Thank you, your kindness is more than enough. But still, do you have any other plans? Yes, like Stella suggested, we're thinking of selling the house. What I couldn't help but exclaim. It's easy to say, but selling the house involves procedures and takes time. It won't be quick enough for Isaac who's going to be admitted to the hospital in a few days. Even if sold, we also need to find a new place to live. It's not a straightforward, smooth sailing process. It's okay. I remembered someone who might be able to help, Isaac said with a smile, looking at me. During the two years since his cancer diagnosis, Isaac fought hard. Despite being told he only had a few months, he managed to make many happy memories with us, his family, through repeated hospital admissions and discharges. Although we had become quite distant when the doctor said he probably won't make it back home. Chachi PT. I contacted his parents' house. After that, they did visit a few times, but they'd quickly leave after saying, he still seems okay, as if just checking on how long he might have left. It almost seemed like they were coming just to check how much longer Isaac had left. I shook my head hastily, trying to dismiss such a terrible thought. I quickly dismissed such a distressing thought, thinking it couldn't possibly be true. When the doctor instructed me to contact the family, I knew the end was near. I hurriedly called my mother-in-law. Oh my, that's terrible. We must hurry. Yes, that's right. Please come to the hospital room right away. Oh, oh yes, I'll come if I can, she replied before hanging up abruptly. Despite the unsettling response, I quickly returned to the hospital room where Isaac and Wyatt were waiting. In the end, only my brother-in-law, who came directly from his job, and Isaac's close friend Thomas arrived. Seeing us all, Isaac weakly opened his eyes, looked around at everyone, and then closed them for the last time. The funeral arrangements and other details were handled by my brother-in-law and Thomas, while we went home to prepare. My brother-in-law stayed with Isaac and Thomas drove us there. We left in the morning when the hospital called, and now the sun was already setting. Wyatt and I had left in such a hurry that morning that we hadn't even cleaned up after breakfast. In the dim evening light, I turned on the lights in the house. Sitting in a chair in the brightened living room, I started flipping through a photo album. As I flipped through the album, tears started to flow on their own. Wiping the tears that fell on the table, I selected a photo for the memorial service. The doorbell rang. I wiped the tears off my cheeks and looked at the monitor. My mother-in-law and Stella were standing there together. Ah, they came to help. They didn't make it in time for the end, but they came and I hurried to the front door to greet them. I opened the door completely stunned. Come on, come on, bring everything in. I heard my mother-in-law's voice as people who looked like movers entered our house, saying, excuse us, in an imposing manner. What? Wait, what's going on? I exclaimed in confusion, hearing my bewildered voice. Wyatt hurried down the stairs from his room upstairs. What's happening, Mom? He asked following the mover's frantic movements with his eyes. I, I don't understand, I replied, bewildered, looking back at Wyatt. We're taking over my son's house. You guys need to leave, exactly get out right now. My father-in-law briskly directed the movers, and the belongings started to fill the living room and other rooms quickly. Wyatt, changing his demeanor abruptly, shouted, No way. Don't you know, auntie? His face pale, this house isn't dad's anymore and it's haunted. On hearing this, my father-in-law turned around, and the movers stopped in their tracks as everyone's attention turned to Wyatt. He shivered visibly. Amidst this, someone entered the house. What are you doing, bringing stuff into someone else's house without permission? 
Get out right now, Thomas's loud voice echoed throughout the house and probably the neighborhood, startling everyone. The movers, without even confirming with their clients, started to hastily remove the belongings they had brought in, confused about what to do. The belongings were left on the street in front of the house. Oh no, my desk. I turned around at the sound of my nephew's voice and saw my brother-in-law standing there with his three children. As the kids complained about their belongings being left on the street, my brother-in-law asked Stella, I came here after getting a sudden call about moving, but what exactly is happening here? Normally mild-mannered, my brother-in-law was clearly angry. But mom said they were moving. What are you talking about? You agreed to this too. Amidst their ugly argument, my brother-in-law coldly announced, I can't deal with you two anymore. I want a divorce. What? Wait, what are you talking about? My brother-in-law then directly negotiated with the movers to have only his and the children's belongings taken to his parents' house. I'm sorry to trouble you at such a difficult time. For now, I'll have the movers take my kids and our stuff to my parents' house, he said, not even glancing at Stella. He and the children then left with the movers. Stella collapsed in tears on the street, and my in-laws stood dumbfounded among the scattered belongings. Neighbors came out to see what was happening, turning the scene into a nightmare spectacle. Can we at least move these things inside? They're in the way here, Thomas suggested. I nodded in agreement. Yes, that's fine. This is your house, after all. What do you mean? My in-laws asked, clearly confused. Here's the real story. Two years ago, the day after we were refused by Isaac's parents, Isaac brought a very intimidating man home. That was Thomas. He owns a real estate business and even gave me his business card. I heard he was Isaac's high school classmate, but his appearance and aura were so intimidating that I mistakenly thought he was from that sort of world. Wyatt, even as a middle schooler, was so scared that he clung to me tightly. Worried, I glanced discreetly at Isaac. Noticing my gaze, Isaac tilted his head and then burst into laughter after a moment. It's okay. Thomas may look intimidating, but he's a respectable businessman now. Wyatt packed up cautiously. Suddenly, Thomas' eyes widened, and he gave Isaac a smack on the head, even though Isaac was sick. I couldn't believe it, but Isaac just laughed heartily. Wyatt was so pale that I was worried whether he was even breathing. Thomas never came to our wedding, even though we invited him. He never visits when we ask him to come over either. Ah, that reminded me. The name Thomas often came up in Isaac's stories about his school days and nights out. From the stories, I had pictured a reliable, good friend, so I never imagined they were the same person. Look at me. I don't attend weddings or visit homes because my scary appearance might cause trouble. Ah, so that's why you're still single, huh? I'll hit you again, watching their playful banter. It was clear he was the Thomas I'd heard about. I couldn't help but chuckle listening to their conversation. Both of them stopped and looked at me. Oh, sorry. It's just that Isaac is so childishly excited. Isaac's always like this. Thomas Wyatt is here. Remember, a father's dignity is important. Dignity, huh? Dad never had that in the first place. Wyatt's interjection lightened the mood. I told Thomas how disappointed Isaac had been that he couldn't attend our wedding, and I expressed our wish for him to visit us any time. Thank you. Now, let's move on to business, as we don't have the luxury of time, Thomas said, suddenly becoming serious. First, let's take a look at the condition of the house. Thomas went through each room, checking their condition one by one. After inspecting everything, including the exterior walls and the meter box, Thomas took out his laptop and started typing something. After a while, he turned the screen to show us. How about this price for the house? The amount he proposed took my breath away. It was higher than what we paid for the house. Um, that's a very generous valuation, but can you really sell it at this price? It's been about 10 years since we moved in, and it would be counterproductive if it doesn't sell. We hadn't renovated for many years like my mother-in-law and sister-in-law said. There are stains here and there, and the hardwood floor is old. Ah, I heard about that from Isaac. They were talking about how they would use each room, right? Yes, yes, that means they think it's good enough to live in as it is. Don't worry, it will sell at this price. Isaac also reassured me. You can trust Thomas, all right? Please proceed at this price, I said with a smile. Thomas immediately laid out several documents on the table. Oh, and we need to find a new place to live, Thomas responded with a smile. Yes, of course. Rental agreement forms were also laid out among the documents. First, I'll directly purchase this house. 
that clears your first concern. Then I'll rent this very house back to you. There, your second concern is also resolved. I was dumbfounded. Thomas continued, I'll transfer the money from the house sale to your account within a few days. We can use it to pay off the remaining mortgage. Thomas smiled confidently, a grin that completely erased his previously intimidating impression resembling the boyish joy. While filling out the documents, I noticed the rental amount for the house, $200. Both Isaac and Wyatt seemed surprised, leaning over to look at the document. You mean $2,000, right? As I laughed, thinking it was a mistake, Thomas said, No, it's not a mistake. I owe that much to Isaac, he explained. After a moment of thought, Isaac replied simply, No, you don't. But Thomas began to tell me about their time as students. It turns out Thomas was a real delinquent in his youth getting into trouble with the police numerous times and frequently involved in fights that left his mother in tears. One day, during those high school years, his mother, who was a single mother, was hospitalized. The combination of exhaustion and stress had taken its toll. When Thomas rushed to the hospital, he was shocked to see how frail and diminished his mother had become. He realized that his behavior was the cause of her stress and broke down crying like a child. From that point on, he changed his ways, stopped fighting, and stayed out of trouble with the police. However, one day, a cigarette butt was found on the school's rooftop. The cigarette butt had ignited nearby trash, causing a small fire. The school made it a big issue, and due to his bad reputation, Thomas was immediately blamed despite his denials. No one believed him because of his past behavior, and he was at risk of being expelled. Fearing he would upset his mother again, Isaac was the only one who believed in Thomas's innocence. He was the only one who believed in my innocence. He was the student council president at the time, you know. We hadn't even spoken before that, Thomas fondly reminisced. I went all the way to the principal's office to protest and I talked to the students to gather evidence. I managed to find the person who smoked the cigarette. Of course, I believed him. He said he didn't do it, so I believed him. No way, no one believed me. But thanks to you, I graduated high school, could be a good son, and even became a business owner. That's why he felt he owed so much to Isaac. As a family, we looked at each other and gratefully accepted the proposal for the rent. This was the story of what happened two years ago, as Wyatt said, I now own this house and am only renting it to your family. If you don't believe me, I can show you the documents later, Thomas said, glancing briefly at Wyatt and then smiling at my in-laws. However, if any of your families want to rent the house, that's fine too. I can rent it out to you at a very reasonable price. I was surprised, and Thomas smiled. I can also introduce you to new properties. The funeral was over without a hitch, and we had moved out of the house and into a two-bedroom apartment that Thomas had recommended. Ah, just unpack the essentials. We'll probably be moving back to the house soon, Thomas said with a grin. Curious about why he thought so, I asked him. Wyatt, also intrigued, came closer to listen. Actually, at that time, I thought about kicking them out, but then, I changed my mind. Here's the plan, Thomas whispered conspiratorially. Three days later, we returned to the house under the pretense of having forgotten some items. Thomas accompanied us, and my mother-in-law reluctantly served us tea and snacks. How do you like living here? Wyatt asked his father-in-law, who had answered with delight. Really? Absolutely. Do you ever hear sounds on the stairs when no one's supposed to be there? Or in the bathroom? Wyatt looked around the living room, visibly scared. Come to think of it, Wyatt, you mentioned it, right? About the ghost. Yeah, Mom probably doesn't know. But ever since Dad got hospitalized, there have been weird noises. Like, I saw the hem of a skirt at the top of the stairs, thinking Mom had come back, but when I checked, no one was there. That's nonsense, interrupting his mother-in-law's words, Wyatt and Thomas simultaneously jerked their heads to look upstairs. Is someone upstairs? That's impossible. Stella, who had become quite downhearted since her divorce from the brother-in-law was decided, was silent. But in the living room, hey, cut it out with the weird talk. I didn't hear anything. Wyatt and Thomas exchanged glances and quickly gathered their things. That's a relief. We'll be taking our leave now. They hurriedly left the house and got into the car. The in-laws who had come to see them off at the entrance had a frightened look on their faces. In the car, we burst into laughter. Thomas's plan was to use the spur of the moment Lie Wyatt had told about seeing the ghosts. It's a punishment for being cold and distant to Isaac for so long. 
In what world do parents and a sister who leave their dying son behind and start preparing to move into this house exist? Thomas said, almost spitting the words as he drove. His words felt true. Eventually, Thomas and Wyatt kept repeating similar things and even paranormal phenomena that were never mentioned seemed to start occurring in that house. The in-laws and Stella were scared on their own, mistaking house noises for poltergeists. They complained to Thomas and Wyatt, but we never experienced any of it. The power of suggestion is scary, isn't it? Wyatt said with a laugh. Finally unable to bear it, the in-laws and Stella moved out of the house. Thomas apparently helped them find a house within their budget. Ah, that was business. I made sure to refer them, found them a cheap apartment within their budget, Thomas said with a sly grin. Wyatt and I applauded him. By the way, Stella, who divorced her husband, had to start working again to pay child support. She seems to be fully experiencing the harshness of society now that the parents who used to take care of them are gone. They have to fend for themselves. I really hope they make it in the end. We returned to the house we bought with Isaac. We can't buy it back, but we still get to live there for $200 a month. The brother-in-law and his three kids have started showing their faces again. Stella seems to want to get back together, but he's not considering it at all right now. And once a month, Thomas comes by under the pretext of collecting rent. He makes sure it's on the monthly anniversary of Isaac's death. After paying respects at the altar, we have dinner together. He even listens to high schooler Wyatt's troubles. Wyatt and I have a little secret joy. It's the stories about Isaac's student days that Thomas sometimes shares during dinner. Many of these stories are new to us, showing us sides of Isaac we never knew. I'm sure Isaac is laughing along with us at the dinner table, making excuses like a child saying, well, you know, he'd say, making excuses like a kid. 